To start with, uh, you probably all know this Facebook map of the world from uh, 2010, which shows the intensity of human connectivity across the globe. And what is very striking was how low the intensity was across Africa. Now, you'll remember what happened in 2009. The CECOM cable was switched on, and that changed everything across all of sub-Saharan Africa. And within three years, that was the picture. And that was the consequence of competition in the market. The CECOM cable didn't suddenly bring us a massive amount of more uh, bandwidth into our homes and faster speeds. What it brought was competition, which resulted in prices falling, more services emerging, more undersea cables being laid down. This shows the capacity of undersea cables serving sub-Saharan Africa. But of course, there are massive holes in that connectivity on a local basis, which this map doesn't show, and this graph doesn't show either. But this graph does help to show it, because this is the growth of fixed-line broadband in South Africa from 2003 to the end of 2013. And this graph is actually one of the great scandals of South African connectivity and South African uh, broadband. In 10 years, we could only reach just over 900,000 fixed-line broadband connections in this country. And it's for one simple reason. It's the fact that there is only one provider of fixed-line broadband. If you don't have competition, there's no incentive to grow the market and there's no incentive to push people into fixed-line broadband. So the solution obviously lies in mobile broadband. And here the picture looks a lot healthier. This is the growth of mobile broadband. It's very dramatic, 11.2 million at the end of last year. So let's look at the growth of mobile connections and users in South Africa. Looking at total connections, you can see it climbed dramatically from 2011 to 2012 and then still climbed in 2013, Six, 69.3 million uh, connections. Obviously, there aren't 69.3 million people in South Africa. Traditionally, we assume that a high proportion of those are people with dual SIMs. That issue is starting to go away. Most cars in this country that are insured have a tracking device uh, in them, and that tracking device has a SIM card in it. Traffic lights have SIM cards. SIM cards are also used for uh, tracking livestock. The actual number is around 41.2 million South Africans. So it's around 80% um, of South Africans, just over 80% of South Africans. It's still a dramatic number. This is a fascinating article that I've been saving for this occasion for the past five years. Will Android and Windows Mobile get squeezed as smartphone market shakes out, assuming that iOS was going to kill Android as well as Windows Phone? It wasn't the iPhone that revolutionized the smartphone market. It was the E72 that revolutionized it back in 2009. Almost overnight, you saw people across the board, business people, uh, aspirant business people, embracing the E72 because it was defined as what they then called an office phone. After that phone was released came this little device, the BlackBerry Curve 8520, which still today is probably the most widely used single model of smartphone on the African continent, almost five years later. But it's at the peak of the bell curve for uh, BlackBerry in emerging markets. In developed markets, BlackBerry is, is already far down the other side of the bell curve. So this is what the market looked like from 2010 to 2012, following the launch of those two uh, devices. Um, you saw Android beginning to emerge, Nokia Symbian jumping in just two years to 4.4 million users in this country on the back of those office phones. It was the E series and the N series that really drove uh, Nokia. And iOS, very slow growth. 0.6 million, 600,000 by the end of uh, 2012, for a few very good reasons. Uh, one being that it was far too expensive. And the second reason was that distribution in this country was appalling. Windows, initially that was Windows Mobile, and gradually it became uh, Windows Phone. And Windows Phone is beginning to make uh, inroads. And then various others, those are the numbers. From 2010 to 2012, we reached 11.5 million smartphones in South Africa. This is what happened last year. Android drew dramatically, just to show you again, it was 1.4 million in 2012. 2013, it grew to 3.9 million, so almost uh, trebled. 
Symbian, meanwhile, began dropping back, and you could see that it was at the peak of that bell curve itself. BlackBerry is still rising last year, dramatically rising, because the curve and its cousins were still hugely popular. The BlackBerry 10 operating system launched at the beginning of last year was a spectacular failure. But in the very same breath, astonishingly, the low-end devices, the curve family, was still rising and was still in demand. iPhones, totally constrained, and then Windows starting to rise. Symbian dropping steadily down to 3.5 million. BlackBerry dropping very slightly down to 4.8 million this year. So that represents the beginning of the descent down the other side of the bell curve. iOS rising to 1.4 million. Again, a result of a high cost and also limited availability. Windows phones rise to 1.6 million. And then, again, a smattering of other devices, bringing the total mark to 18.1 million smartphones by the end of this year. That is a conservative estimate. The networks expect to sell around 5.5 million to 6 million smartphones this year. But a very high proportion of those will be upgrades for people who already have smartphones. So at the very most, half of those will represent new smartphone users. If it is half of those, it will take that number up to 19 million. The operating system that just five years ago was going to be squeezed out now rules the market. The current trajectory, we expect it to reach 12 million users by 2015. So clearly, if you're developing for a platform, Android has to be front and center of your strategy. The tipping point for Android wa uh, was the emergence of the $60 smartphone across Africa. This is the Huawei EDIOS phone, also known as the Google phone. A smartphone that changed the Kenya market literally overnight. So this is what began the change that would result in the mass market embracing the Android uh, smartphone in particular. Now we have the $50 smartphone. Someone who previously would have spent 300 Rand on a phone is not going to think twice about spending a little more, 100 Rand more, and uh, getting a smartphone. Next comes the $30 smartphone. That is a Firefox phone. So this is what we can expect in 2015. Android at 12 million, Symbian dropping down to 2.5 million, BlackBerry dropping down to 3.6 million, iOS rising to 1.6 million, Windows rising to 2.2 million, and other devices, including the ones I just showed you, perhaps reaching half a million. When you break it down in that way, you can see that these numbers are actually conservative. But look at that total, 22 million smartphones by the year 2015. That's huge. And this is the consequence right now. At the end of 2013, we had 13.8 million internet users in South Africa. Look what happens next, from 13.8 million to 15.6 million. A massive jump in 2014. That's a projection, and it's a conservative projection. In, in 2015, it rises to 17 million, and 2016, 18 million. So the question that some of you are already asking, I assume, is how come if smartphones are rising to 22 million by 2015, how come internet use only rises to 17 million? Because surely every smartphone user in South Africa is also an internet user. And that's one of the great pieces of misinformation about internet use in South Africa. Because a, a high proportion of entry-level smartphone users, in fact, don't switch on the internet connection. They cannot afford to use the internet uh, connection. They can just afford to buy the phone itself and then to spend an average of about 100 Rand a month on uh, voice and SMS. They're not going to waste that on 2 Rand or 1 Rand per meg data. So right now we're approaching a, what we call a growth wall. We're seeing hyper growth in internet connectivity and the result is complacency amongst the service providers. By 2016, we reached a saturation of the number of people who can actually afford data. And that's why, just to go back to this graph, that's why the graph flattens after 2016, because we're reaching saturation of the addressable market of Internet users. The ceiling price of data today is 2 Rand per meg, and that's on Vodacom prepaid out of a bundle if you haven't bought a bundle in the first place. On MTN, it's 1 Rand uh, per meg. If you can really afford a massive bundle, two cents per meg. So the really rich pay two cents and the really poor pay two rand per meg. 
That's fair, isn't it? What you really need is a glide path, as we've seen in the uh, interconnect rates, where it was 1 rand 25 five years ago, and now it's down to 20 cents. We're suggesting that this year there should be a ceiling on data cost, prepaid data of uh, 40 cents a meg. And the networks themselves won't do it voluntarily, so I'm suggesting that the regulator should step in and do it. We don't want a market that's too controlled, but when you have a market where you have that massive disparity, that two cents versus two rand, you need an intervention. Bring it down to 20 cents. And that, we believe, should be the maximum that anyone can charge for data in this country, 20 cents per meg. And there are obviously economic issues, but we're talking about a country that is in developmental mode. We have to find ways to bring um, the entire market into the digital economy. This is the potential. By the year 2020, we'll have 30 million people on the internet, which is as close to universal access by adults in this country as one can hope to get. That is the target that's been set by the current Minister of Communications. He's not going to achieve it unless we have that data ceiling or that data price ceiling uh, in place. But he is listening to that argument. So we do have the potential of reaching 30 million internet users in this country by 2020. That's the good news. This is the bad news. Our model of the digital participation curve, that a high proportion of people who were on the internet were not participating in the digital economy, particularly areas like uh, e-commerce or online retail, because they were terrified of it. And we found that there was a strong correlation between being online for five years or more and participating in the digital economy. That's where this model uh, comes from. And I'll read what it says here. It emerges as a combination of experience, comfort with using the medium, confidence in the reliability of the medium, and trust uh, in the medium. Without that trust, people are not going to engage fully in this environment. And trust takes time. It's not about your broadband connection. It's about your experience of the entire environment. And that's not only about devices. It's also about things like fulfillment. It's about customer service. And we know those are still tremendously lacking. This is what the curve looks like. The top is the curve I've already shown you, that flattening curve of internet growth. But if you take the number of people who've been online for five years or more, you can see from 2013 it began growing fast. And this year, in fact, you begin to see the real acceleration of the digital participation curve. And that continues for the rest of the decade. So even though penetration of the population is still relatively low, um, the digital participation curve finally rises to meet that penetration by 2020. And at that point, we'll have 17.2 million experienced users on the Internet. If the data price comes down and we see an acceleration in Internet uh, users, that 17 million could go as high as uh, 20, 22 million experienced users. That is a serious critical mass of people that you can address on the internet, sell products or services to, and draw into the digital economy. So the picture becomes exceptionally bright for the internet economy in the not-too-distant future if we can take action now. Thank you very much.